Uh, all right. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, uh, for what I think is the fourth in a series of lectures looking at um, simple attacking plans and ways to get more invested in the game of chess. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back today. I was hearing from three or four people after last week's lecture that it was a little bit over their heads. And I want to be respectful because I know there are some people here who are fairly experienced chess players who have played a good amount and have some tactics. Um, but I also, I really wanted this whole series to be accessible and to be about people who maybe aren't completely sure if they love this game yet. So I wanted to maybe explain things a little bit more at the beginning, deal with some really simple concepts, and then I think we'll still find our way to something more complex and, and challenging for all levels as we go. So uh, today is about sensitive squares. I'm gonna get into what that means a little more, but for starters, I just wanna start by introducing this concept of the twofold attack. Okay, so, or also known as counting, right? So uh, this is a really simple attacking principle, but actually can become quite complex. And, and honestly, I could do an entire lesson on the concept of counting, but we're just gonna introduce the very first level today and then, and then move ahead. So the, the idea here is pretty simple, which is creating coordination between your pieces, right? We see in this position a very simple diagram, right? We've got the bishop and the knight both coordinating their attack so that we create, right, sort of uh, what we call a one and a half mover, right? where white takes, black takes, and white wins a pawn, right? Obviously, we could also go the other way and begin with the bishop, right? And that would be fun, okay? Um, basically, the, the idea that I wanna plant in your minds is if you ever have more attackers than your opponent has defenders, right? One defender against two attackers, you should be winning that exchange. Now, the reason we could go an entire hour on this, and this whole thing gets very complicated, is you have to also keep in mind the worth of the pieces, right? We're gonna see this a little bit later, but obviously um, each of these, right, bishop and knights are all worth about the same, about three pawns, three points, right? If suddenly I had a rook involved in this exchange, now you also have to take that into account and things get a lot more difficult, right? But this is just the basic concept. Um, that I wanted to go with. Okay, second to that, we also have this idea, a different form of the twofold attack, which is called a battery, right? Now a battery is when you have multiple pieces lined up that attack in the same direction. And by stacking them, you essentially double their power and allow them to create a twofold attack. So we see here, right, that if the rook on a2 were to capture, then okay, my opponent could take once, but then the rook on a1 would be cleared and would be able to take again, right? So this is sort of a more well-hidden form of this same twofold attack, right? We're going to win material, but it's a little bit better disguised, okay? Um, even more scary is uh, something like this in this position, right? We have a battery that is created with the queen and bishop. Okay, and so this one's relatively simple. Um, I'm not gonna stop for quizzing here, but the queen can use the support of the protecting piece to actually capture this pawn on g7. Okay, and that's checkmate because the king of course is not allowed to move into check, so he cannot actually defend himself, right? So once again, if without the support of the bishop, if the queen were to take, it's just a queen sack, the king can grab. But with the protection of the bishop, it becomes a mating attack. Okay, so this is just a simple concept of coordinating your pieces, right, and using them, working together to accomplish a goal that we're gonna see today quite a bit. And I wanted to at least introduce the name of it and the concept before I continued. Okay, so today's lecture, the main event. I wanted to talk today about sensitive squares, right? We had a lecture a couple of weeks ago about weak diagonals. 
and looking at entire ranges of spaces. So now, in a way, we're going to take a step backwards and just look at singular spaces that be can become tender and weak and become great focal points. Now, the most famous of these is Foolish Freddy, right? As uh, we basically always refer to it in, in scholastic education, right? Which is this F-pawn. And I had talked in a previous lecture about why this square was so weak, which is that it is the only square at the beginning of the game, the only pawn, I guess I should say, which is defended by only the king, right? And that creates a lot of tenderness to it because as we saw in the previous example, right? If you get more than one attacker on that target, the king's not really a very good defender. He's not able to defend himself very well, right? So this square is a main target of attack. And we see this at every level um, because every kid and every beginning player to the game learns very quickly this idea of the four move checkmate, right? Which is um, something like this, right? E4, E5, okay, Bishop C4, taking aim at the tender point, okay? Black makes a normal move. White plays queen to h5, doubling up, two-fold attack, right? And the black player, who is probably somebody's friend who's been goaded into playing chess with them, right, and <clears throat> doesn't know very much, now has no idea what's happening and either develops, right, or my favorite rookie mistake plays knight to f6, which is actually another good example um, of some of this, uh, it's, well, maybe I should say it's related to a part, uh, departure and arrival effect, which I've also talked about in previous lectures, right? We hit the queen where it is, but we don't focus on where the queen is going, right? Which is sort of an issue. And so now queen to f7 and we end the game. Okay. Um, I had, <clears throat> I had actually uh, a little bit sneakier version of this which happened to me when I was, I think, 16 years old and had already been playing competitive chess for a couple of years. Um, pretty embarrassing. I, I will never forget this loss, ever. Uh, so I had black in this position, but we'll look at it from white's uh, point of view. And, uh, you know, I was playing uh, probably board two or board three um, on my chess team, and I played e5 as I always did, and my opponent played queen to h5. Okay, taking aim at this tender point on F7. So my question to all of you is, can you be better at me than me at uh, 15 or 16? And can anybody tell me what black should play here? Knight to C6? I mean, Knight to C6. Knight to c6 is a very intelligent move. You have done better than John Harden at 16. <laughs> um, yeah, so the sneaky thing that's happening here is a lot of people, because of this, right, Foolish Freddy stuff, um, they kind of get addicted to, you know, the idea of defending this square, right? But of course, as I said earlier, when there is no two-fold attack yet, this doesn't have to be worried about. Right. But, you know, if we all had a time machine, maybe we could go back and tell me this because I went ahead and said, oh, I better pop him right away. And I played the abysmally bad move, G6. And this is actually. That's, that's what I was going to pick. I, that, was, that was my move. <laughs> so I, Good. Good I on just, you. So I like that move. I like that move very much. Great. Well, you know what? Actually, Rob, I can give you a very good reason why you like that move, which is yeah. now I'm going to guilt trip you. You uh, did not make it to the weak diagonal lecture. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to go back and watch that lecture and you're going to see this theme dealt with. Again, does anybody, I know several of you were here. Does anybody remember the specific theme here? I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a few weeks ago, but just in case. What does white play now? I guess white could take the uh, pawn, that pawn on, uh, come straight over the, uh, on uh, E5 there? The, yes, and put the king in check. 
Yeah, so Queen E5. So at this point, you can ride the emotional roller coaster. Yeah. With me. I remember very distinctly realizing that I had made a mistake, but thinking that I was fine. Right? And I thought, okay, well, I don't want to trade the queens because I'm down a pawn. I want to stay dangerous. Right? And I can remember, it's funny how things just stick with you, but I remember very clearly. Um, get the rook, get the rook. Moment, right? Yeah. And. <laughs> my opponent just ripped off my rook without a second thought. Notice how this g6 move opened the way to my poor, innocent rook who never did nobody no harm. Okay, so this is, oh, you know... He did you harm. <laughs> sorry, say again? He did you harm. Yes, exactly, right? So this is, right, this is absolutely the prudent move to make. And then, of course, right, if your opponent follows up, with bishop c4, well now, Rob, you'll feel a little better here, right? <laughs> Had I but played this move first, now g6 is an excellent move because there's no queen e5 and there's therefore no access to this rook, right? White could, for example, drop back to f3 and now I can play knight to f6, right? I, my queen is guarding it and I'm blocking any hope of being attacked on the f7 square, okay? And, there, you know, that's like that. There's that Dr. John song. It must have been the right, right move at the wrong time. <laughs> must have been the wrong time. I've right been there. in the right place, but right. it must have been the wrong time. time. Quite like right. I am, a fan, I am a fan of Dr. John. I know that song well. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's a funny thing. Now, here, actually, uh, we won't go into this too much, but Black actually is going to start being in the driver's seat because we have a normal... Uh, principles beginning to take over, meaning uh, white has had to make several queen moves, right? Two different moves with his queen, and the queen is still out on a relatively exposed square. Um, and, you know, there's already possibilities here where, for example, after maybe knight to c3, or, uh, you know, what's actually my favorite line here to look at, uh, very instructive, is white trying to play queen to b3, trying to, you know, find yet another way in. And now Black has a really cool idea here, a really cool idea, which is to play knight to d4, okay? Popping the queen. Notice uh, the queen, you know, has to stay local in order to avoid this pawn falling off, right? The knight is grabbing here. Let me uh, clean this up just a little bit, right? I'm threatening to grab here. And if white goes ahead and grabs the pawn, well, now something really funny happens. The king moves, only move, right? Completely forced. And now suddenly white realizes that his queen is attacked and he doesn't have a great way to hang on to that bishop, right? Checking the king again just leads to king takes f7, right? Oops. So of course I can play queen to c4, right? This hangs on. And now can anybody see the way to uh, force force the queen away and win this piece? Kind of a weird move. There's sudden c2. What's that? Knight c2? Yeah. Well, we could take on c2, but that's giving a knight to get a bishop. So we're going to win a pawn. I want to win a whole piece. d7 to d5, maybe? So d7 to d5, actually, thank you, Dory. By the way, welcome. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? I've, I've had some students suggest this before in this position, and I think it does work. It does work, but I'm just going to punt and say there is a stronger move with almost exactly the same idea. But this is very good and, and should lead to a win because black, white gets very tied up. But there's something even more simple because, of course, after this, there's at least like taking and, you know, if king takes right away, maybe it gets a little messy, right? It's a little complicated. There's a way to do it without having to think much at all. One more shot. Is it pawn to, um, you know, yeah, b5? Pawn to b5. Exactly. Right? We notice the knight defends. Okay. Very strange move. But the queen suddenly has no squares from which it can hang on to the bishop. Right? There's just nothing, nothing to be done. Queen to c5, as I said, or other checks just lead to king takes f7. Now... Black will have to play a little carefully for the rest of the game, right? His king is a little bit compromised, but I will deal with a compromised king if I can be up a piece, right? This is 
something that you should all remember and learn from. I have a lot of students who get very uneasy in these kind of positions, right? And assume, oh, I must be worse, I must be worse, you know? But a piece is a piece. And uh, your opponent can't really attack your king too well with only the queen, right? It really needs some support. Okay, so that's a very cool thing and just a good way to proactively defend against these these basic attacks, okay? There was, so, a, there was a really cool discovered attack on the queen. Yeah, it was the queen trapped. Yeah. Oh, uh, after, let me see here. So, I gotta find that line again. Um, oh, she, I don't know why I have so much trouble navigating this thing. The queen was on C5. Yeah, no, that. Queen to C4, there it is, here it is. She's on B5, queen's in, yeah. Right, queen here, king there, and queen. yeah, no, 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 not trapped, not trapped. I have a, I have a, a place to go to, right? But this is totally okay, right? Black should now. I mean, you could really take your pick. I guess knight to c two now, Brian would be very good, yeah. right? That's probably the the easiest way to start winning. Um, and you know, knight to c6 isn't half bad either, but knight to c2 looks like probably the strongest, right? We're going to pick up even more material. I'll probably play bishop to g7, bring the rook out this way, right? And my king will manage. Notice this queen check is not happening because of the knight on f6, right? I've got, I've got all my important squares covered. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put an end to that. So that's a simple idea. Right. What what we're now going to do is start looking at this stuff at a more complex level where white has much more going on. Right. And, and the attack can actually work. Black will have to play a much more sophisticated defense. Right. In these next couple of uh, examples. OK. Um, so we look at another one. Right. Now, I wanted to take a quick moment here, actually. Um, I don't have any grandmasters to, in today's program. <laughs> um, and I like giving you all a, uh, a sort of window into chess history, right? So I wanted to take a minute here and give some, uh, some credit to somebody that I really have come to be friends with, right? Which is Mr. Fred Wilson. So Fred Wilson, is a chess teacher and a bookstore owner in New York. Uh, I first met Fred probably 15, no, that can't be right. Uh, I guess 10 years ago, right? Sometime when I was uh, at NYU, um, I met Fred. I wandered into his chess shop, which was then on 11th Street and now is on 17th. Um, he has been teaching chess for 45 years. He is one of the oldest members of the United States Chess Federation to make master. He made chess master at 71 years old. So for any of you who are starting chess relatively late, right, and think that it's really not something that you can pick up later in life, Fred is a really great counterexample. Now, in fairness, he was playing chess for a long time before that, but still to make master, right, to be gaining rating, at 71, I think is really incredibly impressive. Um, he is uh, a great friend, a very smart man, and can be seen at basically any chess tournament in the tri-state area. He's usually there with a table full of books, right, up for sale. So uh, he's kind of a ubiquitous person in the scene. Um, and the reason I bring him up is because we are actually gonna be looking at a couple of games from his book simple attacking plans, which I would say is a pretty good post-beginner book. Some of the games do get fairly complex, right? But as something to teach you some attacking plans and uh, look at things that are, are simple and easy to understand and all oriented around a theme, this book is pretty good. So Fred Wilson's Simple Attacking Plans, I'm sure you can find it um, online. And certainly if you're in the New York area, again, once things settle down a bit. So we're gonna look at a couple of games out of this book um, that Fred has provided me with, and I wanted to give full credit where credit was due. Okay, so here is the first game. Um, this is a couple of amateur players, right? No one, uh, no one that we know, okay? But we're gonna see some of these ideas in action, okay? So the game begins reasonably enough. Knight to f3, attacking the pawn, knight to c6, defending. Okay, white now offers d4, 
just deciding to mix things up in the center right away. This is known as the scotch game. What follows is not going to be in any way theory for the scotch, but uh, this is a very normal way to play. This is actually the opening that I like. Um, it offers white chances to create open lines, right? With pawn exchanges often happening right away, you get a lot of active piece play and a lot of tactics. So, you know, certainly you could do a lot worse than to, um, than to play this if you're looking for an opening against e5. Black now plays f6. Again, <coughs> we looked at this two weeks ago, okay? And we know that part of the issue with this move is the weak diagonal on e8 to h5. But there's another problem as well, which is the other weak diagonal that it creates, okay? The bishop, by coming to c4, offers full access all the way down to f7 and even to g8. Now, for those of you who maybe are a little bit newer to the game, you cannot castle into check. So this bishop c4 move takes control not only of some critical squares that we've already looked at, but also kind of guarantees that black's going to have to stay in the center for at least a few more turns. Okay? Now, as it happens, black actually plays yet another bad move that doesn't look too bad. And he plays bishop e7, trying to develop and probably thinking that after something like takes, that he is going to be able to defend against knight g5 and other incursions on the king side. Unfortunately, white has another idea, which is really, really awful. And if you're not peeking at the moves, right, maybe hazard a guess. What does white play now? Queen to d5. Queen to d5. Battery, right? Just like we talked about earlier. Okay, the bishop supports the queen. We have access to the foolish Freddy checkmate square. And there's honestly a shockingly little amount that black can do about it. Obviously, knight to f6 falls prey to our don't worry about where I am, worry about where I'm going problem. But other defenses also fail. Now, in the game, black tried... Uh, pawn to d6, okay, and now white wraps things up very quickly with queen to f7, king to d7, and now you notice the king is extremely short on any squares, so bishop to e6 is just the end of things. Okay, but a little bit more complicated, right? What if, maybe some of you are already thinking, what if knight to h6? Right, this seems to guard against the threat and develop. So what could be possibly wrong with this? You got your bishop. Bishop to h6, right? Removing what is known as removing the guard. Another tactical sequence, um, another tactical theme that we could probably spend a whole lecture on, right? Yeah, we play bishop to h6 and suddenly there's no knight and you don't have time to take back because remember, I've got checkmate in one. Okay, so, you know, at this point, black would have to play the incredibly desperate rook to f8. And then, you know, probably bishop to g7, now threatening to take the rook, right? And maybe there's some desperate way here for black to hang on for a few turns. But honestly, it looks like, you know, I'm not really sure what there is. Um, maybe I could move to f4, I guess. But then, even then, maybe queen to g8 and... Uh, you know, somebody's just going to have to come back. So th this is this is pretty bad news. <laughs> pretty bad news, to say the least. Okay, so um, any questions on that game before we move on to more games? I've got a lot to, you know, as usual, I've taken on more than I can chew today, but... <laughs> okay, very good. So we'll move on. Um, yeah, so, okay. Uh, this is something I just wanted to kind of throw in, right, to look at, which is this idea that, you know, there's actually mainline openings that center around this idea of the F7 square, right? If you look at this opening for black, there are two main responses here. They're both good, but if you play knight to F6 in this position, right, white can actually immediately start a ruckus with knight to G5, now, this doesn't threaten checkmate, but is a really good example of just how quickly you can be in trouble, right? Notice that queen to e7, 
is a terrible move, unfortunately, right? This is a mistake that falls victim to the counting errors that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, right? I have two defenders, you have two attackers. What's the big deal? Well, the problem is the queen is worth about nine points. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take because if you wanna recapture and make this set of trades, that's fine with me, right? So black here has to play actually an extremely key move. Anybody know what it is? What's the only move here that's really any good for black? D5. D5, right? The only way to survive here is actually to sack a pawn, right? And uh, white can take and then Black usually will play knight to a5, or a move that I'm a really big fan of, actually, um, is the Ulvastad variation with b5. But we'll leave that for another day, right? You know, even, even, um, even when you're doing everything right, sometimes you have to know some key details about how to defend this square. Okay, so um, one more before I move on to the next topic. Right, we can see that black can also make use of some of these patterns, right? Usually because of that second move slight disadvantage, black's not as well positioned, but it's still absolutely possible, right? So we have um, in what's called a Rui Lopez, this is what this opening is called, uh, named after the 15th century Spanish monk who first wrote about it, um, right? We have this move bishop to c5 with the idea that if white now takes the knight, right, and tries to win a pawn here, black now has the really cute response of queen to d4. And we see a very similar pattern that we had earlier, right, with white on the bishop c4 and the queen on d5. This is kind of the mirror image. And now white has a lot of problems because he's got a loose knight, he's got a loose pawn, and he's got a checkmate threat. Now, white can deal with this. Does anybody see the one defensive move that white has here? Knight d6. Uh, knight d3, you gotta reverse the board in your brain, but yes, that's the right place, right? Knight d3 holds here, but of course we can still get our pawn back, right? And play might continue, you know, queen e2, we'll trade the queens, I'll drop my bishop back, okay? And black has the better game. Um, if anyone's wondering why that is, well, okay, so your king is a little bit exposed and can't castle. Uh, I have the bishop pair. Bishops are very good. Go into that another day. Um, and, uh, of course, material is equal. So white has won nothing for all of his farting around. Okay. All right. So this is all very well and good. And no doubt many of you have seen many of these ideas before about attacking f7. But what I'd like to get into in the second half is looking at, well, okay, great, but what if my opponent successfully castles? What if my opponent doesn't just fall over to these simple attacking themes, right, and knows how to successfully guard Foolish Freddy? What then? Well, the answer is since most of the time your opponent's going to castle kingside because it's the shortest castling, right, you can only uh, you can get there after only moving two pieces as opposed to three, right? So generally speaking, most games feature castling short um, because it's more efficient, right? The new target switches a little. Now, F7 can still be a bit tender, but the new target tends to be this H7 and H2 pawn, okay? As we'll see in the following games, Right? Because, of course, you have to use your imagination here a little bit, but when the king has moved to g8 or g1, this is now the new square. Right, This is the one that's near the king and not as well defended. Notice the rook will have come to f1. Right Now, of course, there are some defenders around that square that we'll look at, but um, as you'll see, right, they can be dealt with. So we're going to just go ahead and see this in action. Right. So this is another game uh, from Fred Wilson's book out of his first chapter. Uh, a couple of sixth graders playing at a local tournament. One of them was Fred's student. Okay, so we have, again, same beginning, right? Very kind of symmetrical. I attack the pawn, you defend. All right, and we enter what is very amazingly called the Four Knights game. Very mysterious uh, naming system here. Okay, and White now makes actually a, a small mistake. Okay, um, 
we're going to probably talk about this specific tactical theme in next week's lecture, because I think it fits in very well with do's and don'ts when playing black. But um, this a little bit strange, right? Not super principled, but just sort of something to know when you play these openings. Um, this particular setup of the bishop on c4 and the knight on c3 can sometimes fall victim to a little tactical trick, right? Which is called the center fork trick, where black now plays knight takes c4. Very strange move, right? We're just dumping a piece. But the problem is that if white takes back, anybody see what is, how does black respond? D5. D5. D5 right away. Mm. And I'm getting my piece back, right? Now, best play for white would then continue bishop D3, takes, takes, okay? And if you take a quick second here, you might be a little bit, uh, a little bit nonplussed at the, uh, the point of all of this because there's no material loss, right? There's absolutely nothing um, concrete that Black has gained except that the center pawn is missing, right? White's center pawn has been eliminated and this allows Black some more freedom in the center, okay? So we'll, we'll talk about the center and, and, you know, our center pawns a little bit more in another lecture. But I just wanted to explain why it was that black now played this knight takes e4 move and white actually did not take back <laughs> white played now bishop to d5 okay a little bit mysterious but you see it stops the pawn from being able to come to that square so uh yeah so sorry about that for a moment i had to I had to mute my own mother uh okay <laughs> so, <laughs> it, happens. it happens so uh okay so um, at this point, probably black would be best advised to just draw back, right? And, uh, you know, play might continue like knight to f6, right? We have some exchanges, white gets his pawn back, um, and uh, black is reasonably happy, right? Material is even, but he has good development. He's one move away from castling, and the game would go down a different path, okay? Instead, he tries to hang on to his pawn by trading pieces off, Right, Bill, I wanted to take a quick second and make sure we acknowledged this, that, you know, principle might say that white should recapture towards the center, but actually the best move here is to take away from the center because it offers so much more possibility for white with development, right? right? And that's just a, a good example of, right, uh, that Philidor quote from last week, right? You should always do this, except when it is incorrect to do so, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so, okay. White has now opened the center, right? Has some attacking possibilities. Um, and black now played bishop to c5. Now, the actual probably best move here was just very conservatively coming to e7 right, in order to guard against the g5 square and also not give himself a tactical liability of a loose piece on, a, on an open board, right? It's easy to underestimate how dangerous just hanging a piece out there loose can be, okay? And already white had some tactics here, but we're going to just proceed forward because I want to make sure to get to the, the second game. So white castled, also a good move, um, and black castled. So, this is, this is the, the critical moment of the game. We see that white seems to have good prospects for development, right? He has two more pieces left before we could say his rooks can see each other, right? Two more moves. Um, his bishop and knight are both reasonably well deployed on attacking squares. But we also notice that f7 is pretty well defended, right? It's attacked once, but defended twice. So it doesn't seem like we're gonna get any cheapos this time, okay? So the question comes, okay, how, how can white continue? How can we continue to make this an interesting game and not something where we wander around a little bit? I mean, certainly there is the option of something like bishop g5, but uh, I think after queen moves to e8 is probably okay. But also, you know, just the dropping the bishop back and offering to make some trades, 
right, we'll probably also leave black in a pretty comfortable position. I might even, after this, uh, I could take with queen or I can take even with the knight. And I think probably there I'm reasonably happy. I can start moving my center pawns, right, get my bishop out and everything's going to be fine. So white needs to figure out a target. And this is where we notice something critical. If you compare the two king sides, you'll notice there is exactly one differing feature. What is it? The knight. The knight, yes. Say it confidently. Yes, the knight. Okay, so what does this knight have to do with things? Well, the knight does a great job of guarding h2, right? This is one of the jobs of the knight on f3 is that he makes sure that this tender square is not so tender. If you look at this side of the board, because that knight was exchanged off earlier in the game, there is no knight on f6. Because there's no knight on f6, you suddenly maybe have already gotten ahead of me here, noticed that h7 is now the new foolish Freddy. <laughs> Meet the h-pawn. Same as the f-pawn or something. I don't know if that quite works. Okay. We're doing it live, people. Um, yeah, so this is the new tender point. So this is an attacking theme that I think everyone can use. And we're going to see, actually, I have one more game that we're going to look at to look at how black can use the same idea, right? Knight to g5. Not bishop to g5 hitting the queen, but knight to g5 starting to put more pressure on the sensitive squares. Now, black should absolutely, if he is an experienced player, should understand what is coming and has to immediately punch back with h6. You have to kick this knight out. It is much more dangerous than it might seem. And then play might continue, but white still has very good chances here, unfortunately for black, because play could continue with knight takes, right, bishop takes. Now, running through that quickly, we're going to have a three-point bishop and a three-point knight traded for five-point rook and a one-point pawn. So six on six, which makes it, you know, at least equal. But of course, at the end, white is going to be able to come out ahead, um, even though I think actually currently he is, uh, he is down some, but he's able to come out ahead here, right? How? Anybody see the, the final move of this combination? I'll give you a, a very uh, big hint, which is that it has to do with our loose piece that's on c5. Queen d5. Queen d5, thank you, right? And we pick up the loose bishop, uh. okay? King moves, queen, right? Maybe he moves again. All right, and when all the, the blood has been spilt and things settle down a little bit, we see we have, right, rook for rook, bishop for bishop, but we are up what's called the exchange, up the exchange, which is the difference between uh, rook and knight. Okay, so a sideline, but I want you to remember that, that if this knight comes in, right, you're going to see what happens after this. Take it as an instructive point. It might be a good idea to kick him as quickly as possible. Okay, d6, black does not understand the danger. And now here comes the point. Queen to h5. We saw similar moves, right, when the f-pawn had been moved. We saw how deadly this was with the queen on e8. Well, it's no less deadly after the king is castled. I'm now threatening checkmate in one, and I've actually gone ahead and doubled up and put pressure on the old square as well. Now, it was pretty well defended before, but suddenly it's a three on two. The balance has shifted. Black played h6, one move too late. We see all the same combinations from before. Knight takes f7. Now black has to take here. It might be tempting to try and just give the pawn and run away, but the problem is there's a massive discovery sitting with the bishop on d5. So if, for example, right, notice our queen is hit. Let's say I tried to play uh, queen to e7. There would now follow knight to h6, double check. Always a fun thing to get to do. Okay, so neither piece can be taken. Uh, the king moves, and then very simply, knight to g4 is checkmate. Notice the role of the bishop here in keeping the king from running. Okay, we're going to see that theme come back in our last game today. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the game finished.
right? Rook takes, bishop takes. And now black makes the final mistake of this game, which is he needs to at least uh, drop over to f8, come back to where his pieces are so that he can get some help with the defense. Instead, he thinks that his pawn cover will save him. And they're now followed. What move? Bishop captures on h6. Bishop captures on h6. We, we huff and we puff and we blow the door down. Now, I'm not a big fan of teaching too many sacrifices to new players. I think you're actually far better off playing like a banker and not letting anything go without having a darn good reason. But if you can calculate it all the way out to checkmate, it's not really a sacrifice, right? A true sacrifice is speculative, at least somewhat, right? A, a sacrifice that you can find the return on and can trust, go right ahead. Okay, so this was uh, functionally the end of the game because, of course, if black takes, white just takes back, and now the king is mated. Um, I think in the game, because they were kids, I mentioned in a previous lecture, kids generally take a long time to resign. Uh, queen to f6. I've, oh, I seem to have lagged out of Lee Chess. Interesting. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and we pick up the queen because, of course, blocking does nothing. Okay. All right. Cool. Our final event of the day. And then I'll take any questions that there might be. So uh, this is my game. This is a game uh, that I played in a theme tournament that I was in on chess.com. Uh, I love theme tournaments. I think they're a really excellent way to practice. Um, what is a theme tournament? A theme tournament is essentially, I mean, they can, I suppose, revolve around any number of themes. But the ones that I'm talking about are tournaments that are oriented around a particular opening. Right? So essentially, the, the rules are set up so that you must play a particular opening in order to participate in the tournament. And I think these are excellent because they give you a lot of practice in a particular opening you're trying to learn over a very short amount of time, right? So I played in this tournament because I was trying to learn more about the scotch. Um, and I was perfectly happy to play both the black and white sides of it to see what kind of ideas people threw at me. So this is that game, okay? So again, we see the beginning. Hopefully at this point doesn't need a lot of discussion, right? And again, white goes with this move d4. Another thing I'm going to talk about next week um, is it's usually a good idea to take your opponent's center pawn when you can. So I went ahead and did that. Right? He takes back. Now uh, I develop a piece. There's actually a lot of reasonable moves for black here. You can play bishop to c5, right, to develop and attack the knight. You can actually even play this kind of funky move, bishop to b4, right, and... Uh, Bishop a5, I'm not a fan of this line, but it's, it's playable. Um, and then there's the move that I chose, which is to say, you know, the king's pawn is uh, not defended at the beginning of the game, so I'm going to go ahead and play knight to f6 right, and just kind of see what you want to do about that. White develops and defends. I play now bishop b4, which pins his defender, essentially bringing this up for discussion again, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, the e-pawn is thrown back open for negotiation, okay? And now, actually, this has very little to do with our themes today, but I can't help but mention it, okay? Um, a really common rookie mistake that white could now make would be to play bishop to d3, okay? Trying to defend his pawn. And anybody want to tell me why is this so rotten? What does black now play to embarrass white? Knight captures on d4. Knight takes on d4, right? With all the kerfuffle, <laughs> you forgot that the queen was doing a pretty important job by guarding that knight, right? So bishop d3 is not something that you can play. So white has, uh, you know, enough experience, right? He sees right through this and takes first. I think this is a good, like, question, you know, generally. Yeah. How do you... Um... Like, how do you, what is your mental model to, to not make those kind of mistakes, right? Is it that you're just constantly keeping in, in your mind those lines of protection? Or how do you guard against 
forgetting those kind of things. Like yeah, we're not having to recheck a, everything each turn. Yeah, that's a fabulous question, and thank you for asking it. So I have a few different answers to that, um, but I'll try and be brief with them. The first one is pretty obvious, which is just experience. Um, if you know your opening and you play it regularly, you will obviously have these kinds of painful losses that you will not forget, right? Um, it's important to embrace losing as part of getting better at chess because the emotional wound of the loss. I mean, think about that game when I was 16 that I will never forget, For right? Sure. Yeah. It's like, I remember my losses from my high school days way better than any of my wins. Um, because they were, well, because I hate losing, I guess. Um, so that's the first thing, right, is just experience and playing. The other thing that I will say is I am an unbelievably huge fan of the steps method. I use this with every single one of my private students. So what is this? Uh, it's a series of workbooks that are designed to take a student all the way up from a total beginner through to a... I think 2,000, 2,100 player, right? So I work on this same series that my students do. They're all generally, I don't have any students above step two or three, right? I work on step five and six um, on my own. And the reason I mention it is uh, there's lots of ways to learn chess. What I love about the steps books, and I'm happy to send the links to anybody who's interested, right? We can talk about it after. But what I love about these workbooks is if you do step one and step one plus, there are whole workbooks that are nothing more than puzzles about those exact kinds of things, right? You need to defend your pawn and in one move, and how do you do it? And if you get some of these books, and as I do, set a goal of trying to get through a page of them a day, right? Which maybe sounds intense, but the puzzles themselves are designed to take, you know, maybe a minute or two to solve, right? They're not meant to be super complex. It's just about pushing the patterns into your noodle, okay? If you do that with this book, one plus and one mix, by the time you've been through them, you don't, right, along with uh, game experience, I should add, right, along with playing, you don't make those kind of mistakes anymore. You know, will you, open, will you open up that book just so I'm kind of curious what it looks like and what the, yeah. what the, So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, Oh, cool, okay. Doing some pretty heavy work advertising for people. I get no money from this, by the way. <laughs> Zero dollars, unfortunately. Uh, I would love it if you... Yes. Um, yeah, so the way that they're laid out, I'm not going to, I'm going to move along, but the way that they're laid out is there's a theme. I don't know how well you can see, and forgive me, I hadn't planned this, but there's a theme, a diagram. If there is a black dot, that indicates black to play. Uh, and if there's no dot is white to play. Right. Uh, and the exercises range all over the place. And there are actually instructor manuals that go with each step to help you understand the exercises further. They, the reason I don't always recommend them is obviously it's a lot, right? I just named three different workbooks and I know it's very intense. Um, but I will say I haven't found anything that does as effective a job of leading you through a relentless number of puzzles <laughs> and just really training you on the basics. I will say one more and then we'll move along is uh, there's a website that this I can bring up. There's a website called uh, Chessity, um, which is a paid subscription website, but is kind of built with the chess steps in mind, right? I know it's, it's very much marketed to children as chess often is, but it's a similar thing that it, it starts from the absolute basic of little games and puzzles for vision, right? Which I think, Andrew, is a wonderful goal to try and work on because like I was saying last week, um, you, vision problems really spoil the game for you, right? They, you play a good game and then you just miss something so simple and everything collapses. It, it makes chess hard to pick back up, right? So doing something, if you're willing to put in the time, right, to work on that so that it starts to go away and your losses at least are for respectable reasons, right? That can do a lot for increasing your understanding and enjoyment of the game. Okay, back to our main event here. 
Um, I will take a few more questions at the end, but I want to make sure I stay on time with an hour for the main lecture. So I, I got to breeze through this a little bit. So um, I took back with a B pawn, right? So Bill, here's yet another turn in the whole discussion, right? We take back towards the center here, but that's not why, right? I took back here because I don't want to end up getting my queen exchanged unfavorably, right? My king can't castle and uh, this is not ideal for me, okay? So, you know, different circumstances governing the decision every single time, okay? White can now play this move because he doesn't have a knight hanging on d4. Black uh, breaks in the center with d5, okay? Uh, white castles, okay? If he were to um, try and lunge forward with the pawn, black actually is okay after knight to g4, right? Notice I can circle back around and try and pick this up, and the bishop is making sure that I am not falling off, okay? So play might continue with castles, and then castles, right? And I'm threatening to, uh, to win this back, okay? It would be a different game, but I just wanted to quickly mention it. Okay, so white castles. Instead, I castle. You notice, right, we're very much obeying principle. I am trying to play for speedy development. One of the other virtues of this d5 move was it gave me a lane for my bishop to come out, okay? Um, white now plays the first move that I'm not as excited about in the game. Right, which is bishop to d2. Um, probably, I'm trying to think here, probably, yeah, just taking in the center, right? And then um, the computer is suggesting maybe h3. That move is going to be clearer in a minute when you see what I get up to. Um, but yeah, probably taking in the center and then even, um, I think maybe trying to play bishop g5 looks more aggressive. Um, trying to pin my knight and cause more problems for me. Okay, so bishop d2 just tells me the guy is, is a scared. Um, rook to b8. Okay, this is not very complicated at all. I just want to guard my bishop because there's some potential right, tension here that if the knight ever moves, you know, I could get into trouble. So I just make a nice developing move. Notice the rook is also very happy on the open lane. Okay, rook to e1. And now, turn the computer off so it doesn't offer quote-unquote helpful arrows. That's not what I played anyway. This is where you can see if you remember what I was talking about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> what does black play here? Knight to g4. Knight to g4, okay? With the same ideas that we saw in the previous game, okay? Now, if white had seen what I was up to, I had a plan for this, right? We don't just make this move planning that if he kicks us, we gotta go back. Right? That is not good play. My plan was to actually circle the knight around to the center and play knight to e5. And you notice that now I've got a good chance to maybe exchange this knight off for the bishop. Now, again, I'm not getting into this today, but that would give me what is known as the bishop pair. Right? I have two bishops and you don't. So I thought this would lead to a reasonable position for me. Black is not winning. Black might be a little better, it's not clear, but I thought I was okay, right? It would be a chess game, and we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, but of course, we're not here for that. We paid for blood. So uh, <laughs> White now plays ED, and what do we play? Do we take our pawn back? No. No, I don't want my pawn back. <laughs> we don't need no stinking pawns. No, I want to gut him. What do I play? Queen to H4. Thank you. <laughs> Queen to h4, right? I don't care about a measly pawn. I am in your house, okay? Again, we see very similarly to the last game. He plays h3. Oh, I should mention, this game I played uh, earlier this year, and I absolutely saw this knight g4 idea because of that game out of Fred's book that had made an impression on me many years before, right? So, you know, this is how you learn chess, right? Uh, you, it's a mix of your own experience and your own mistakes and very much soaking up the games of others to help speed things up, right? So you're not only reliant on your own ideas. Anyway, that's why you come up to lectures like these. Okay, so he plays h3. Obviously, this is too little too late. Um, I now had a lot of thinking to do about whether to take with knight or take with queen. Um, I eventually opted for the queen because I thought after knight f2, 
right? That, um, okay, I've stolen a pawn, but maybe after queen f3, it could be a little bit um, tricky. You know, I could, I could try and maybe get something going, but I think after maybe bishop to e3, my attack is over. Um, the knight's not trapped. Of course, I can trade him, right? But I, I just thought, you know, I wasn't continuing to attack. And like I said earlier, if I have an opportunity to just checkmate the guy, I'm going to do that. I don't want to just go up a pawn and try and grind him down, right? Not if I have an option. So I had a different idea. Uh, queen to f2, check, okay? King to h1. And now I just realized that we have to back up. <laughs> I have missed a critical moment in the earlier game, which I wanted to show you all, which was what would happen if the king had been smart enough to go to f8, right, instead of h8. Okay, and we now had a pretty sneaky idea here, okay, which was, I think now there's, you know, um, White has to make a couple of moves to get this going, right? But, uh, okay. Oh, excuse me, you know what, here. I, uh, hmm. Hmm. I seem to have lost track of my idea. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. It's not finding it in the... Hmm. You know what? It's fine. We'll do it live. Okay. Forgive me on that one. Okay, so uh, there's something kind of interesting here, which is I now played queen to g3. So this, this move is probably the hardest move in the whole position. And I've gone and given it away, but here we are, okay? The immediate threat should be reasonably clear, okay? Queen to h2. But what's a little bit less clear and was an idea that I wanted to demonstrate earlier was there's a problem with the obvious reply, which of course black makes, right? He nips off my, he nips off my knight and therefore temporarily halts the attack. But there's a price that's been paid. And the price that's been paid for this capture is that now the h files open. So suddenly, attacks like queen h4, right, don't have to deal with the pawn cover that's on h3. There's no more further sacrifice necessary to huff and puff and blow down the door, right? This king is very, very shaky, okay, as the next few moves will demonstrate. So, we have queen to d6, uh, bishop to d6, excuse me, right? Again, threatening mate, but also nicely bringing my bishop back into the attack with a tempo, meaning white doesn't have time to react, so I essentially get a free move, right? He has to play king to g1 to get out of there, right? You can't allow me to just do this, okay? Bishop to g4, entering here. And now probably the best way for uh, white to put up resistance was to play queen to c1, okay? Because he can maybe start to, uh, you know, hold some squares by creating a battery and supporting his pieces, okay? Um, but now I think probably best play for black would have been bishop f3. Notice the pawn cannot take, he is pinned. Bishop f1, defending that idea. And then a really nice move, something that um, I find never occurs to new players, is to play a rook lift. Rook to b4 with the idea of bringing the rook over to h4 and threatening mate again. And I hope, without going any further, that you can see how black's pieces are just swarming around the king and white is simply not going to be fast enough to be able to get in there, All right? So this would have been far more interesting and kind of like Bobby Fischer two weeks ago, I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to do this because instead my opponent just tried to guard with bishop to e2, which seems, you know, innocent enough, but it cuts off the rook's control of e3, okay? And now who can find the finish? C5. Speak up. Well, there's that queen to uh, 
move up to attack the king, whichever. Where is seven? Yes. Move here? Up there. Yes. All right, so we can play queen h2, king f1, and maybe um, this is a few ideas. Maybe maybe I could maybe I could do this. This might be good enough. Yeah, this might this might actually be good enough because. Um, I am threatening to take here. Oh, you know what, though? Maybe there's some... Um, it gets a little bit tricky, because maybe after I take here, the king has a run square, right? And I can keep checking him, but he keeps having some place to go, and, and maybe it's going to take me a minute. Prob probably black is still winning, right? I think, you know, here, here come the rooks, and this is, yeah, probably good enough. But it's maybe not quite as clean. Right? There's something there's something that black has that's a little more precise. So keep in mind what I was saying about how the rook no longer has access, right? And how that might affect bringing in defenders. Bishop to c5. Bishop to c5, which I heard earlier. I just wanted to hear with more confidence. <laughs> Bishop to c5 check. Okay, so if king to f1, queen f2 is just mate. There's our first sensitive square. Okay, from the beginning. Uh, notice that bishop e3 used to be a possibility, but without the rook's control, now just drops a piece. Uh, yeah. Right? And then most critically is this idea that I brought up earlier, right? So king to h1, what does black play now? Queen h4. Queen h4. Checkmate. Notice the bishop guards the only flight square. Right? So the, the price being paid for this pawn capture earlier, right? Which I forced him to do. I mean, it, he didn't have much of an option. He was made in one. Okay, so um, I'm happy to make this entire lecture, you know, available to anybody who wants the link. Um, I hope this gives you some further attacking ideas, right? And ways to keep the game exciting and fun even after your opponent has castled and robbed you of the chance to... Uh, Checkmate, you know, in four moves. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep looking at this. Now, there are far more dramatic versions of these H-pawn uh, attacks, right? And, you know, there's G-pawn attacks. I mean, you, you could almost write a book on any square in your opponent's position and the thematic attacks that happen there. But these are very easy to understand, and they end up in checkmate, which makes them very concrete, right? There's no questions there. It's not winning a little bit of material and then having to grind your opponent down, right? It's game is over. I won. We have no questions. That being said, the bear. say that? It is exit pursued by a bear. Exactly, yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You're playing to the right audience. Um, any questions, either on this or any – I mean, this is your time, right? I uh, – I'm happy to stay here for another 10 or 15. Um, if anyone has any questions about today's lecture or chess in general, I will endeavor to answer as best as I can. John, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions I don't want to, I don't want to dominate. Um, uh, it seems to me I'm interested all along with, you know, since I follow these uh, various uh, major tournaments on uh, on chess.com in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm lazy and bad about playing my own games, but I blow a lot of time doing that. Not sure I'm learning anything, to be honest with you. Uh, but I'm always fascinated by the commentary. I may have made this point in another lecture before. Ask uh, how well the, particularly the Grandmaster commentators see the board. Now, it seems to me I have, my brain has to do a couple things all the way through mm -hmm. any chess game. Seems to me I have to somehow recognize a pattern statically, and then if a move is made, also somehow calculate or see the board subsequently in order to make an intelligent move thereafter. In other words, these guys look at the position and they say, oh, white is winning, mm -hmm. and then for example, you know, just take a look at the openings. I would blunder immediately in the earlier games in the openings because I would not have thought through what happens if I push this pawn here. I wouldn't see the board or I wouldn't recognize necessarily what was going to ensue from there. So yeah. 
So obviously I can, you know, I work with, you know, if I do my chest steps and I learn some patterns and I may recognize certain tactics, mm-hmm. it seems to me I also have this sort of meta issue of, you know, like our young, uh, our younger uh, um, guest here sees immediately what needs to be played next in a way that, oh, if I had thought about it for 15 minutes, right. I might solve the problem too. Yeah. But he already knows where to go or why that'll work in the combination. Yeah. So well, I'm stuck in that level. Right. Well, let me let me just say, Bill, I, I think you know what the problem is and you started with it. <laughs> if you play, you learn. And, yeah. you know, essentially, like, look, I don't mean this as criticism. I truly don't because my absolute opinion that I always have to remind myself of, despite being a coach and therefore being pushy, um, is that people can enjoy chess however they want. And if all any of you I want to do is to turn up to my lectures and watch and spend a little time and then let it go, that's fine with me. I'm delighted to have your company for this because it's been interesting for me and I've learned from having to prepare these and from your questions. But that being said, uh, Brian, just to name check him, plays relentlessly. <laughs> all the time. Uh, he plays all the time. He's, I think, currently VP or president of your chess club, Brian? Uh, he he had to step out to ah I'm sorry about that yes, but he, he yeah we don't have titles but yes he runs the chess club when when college is on campus he, he runs yeah, when college exists yeah um, so if you want to get better at identifying these things just play games and these sorts of lessons and books will help you understand what's happening right of course that's important you don't want to just play meaningless games where I don't really know why I lost right and I have nothing to gain from it that's terrible. But if you don't play, um, you become like a person who's essentially trying to learn how to drive a car by reading a book. Right. Right? It is not a knowledge-based game to the extent that people think. There's a lot of knowledge involved, and I do recognize that. But it is far better understood as a game of skill, as something that you have to do and you have to learn by doing. And I know that as well as anyone because I have been a coach who never made time to play for many years. And only in the last couple of years, obviously now being a good example, I've made a lot of space to play and finally started seeing progress again. Um, So that's, yeah. Anyone else? Do you notice a difference in terms of playing when you're like, hey, I'm just going to play and whatever happens versus playing with a particular focus of like, I'm going to play and try this opening or I'm going to play and do that. Like, do you, you know, what's the balance of just playing, you know, neutrally versus playing with an active learning goal in mind? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so so to me, um, a good rule of thumb, I would say, is that the longer the time control, right, the more time allotted for the game, the more seriously I take it. So um, in terms of learning a new opening, I highly, highly recommend if you're deciding to, you know, uh, maybe, you know, I asked John and he gave me the name of this book and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to just learn this thing, right? Play a bunch, I mean, dozens if you can, of blitz games, right? Play five minutes each side. Play 10 minutes each side. If, if five is a little bit too much, right, it's, you, you can't make sense of it because it's too quick. Play 10 minutes. You get the whole game done in less than 20 minutes and you have a whole thing that you can start to look at right? And that's still pretty casual. The loss doesn't hurt so much, right? It's just 10 to 20 minutes, you know, you can chuck it and go on with your day. When you're ready to play serious chess, you, I mean, you know, we're not in a situation right now where you can play over the board. So I won't get into the kind of time controls that you find in chess tournaments over the board, because those are very long indeed. But I find you really can't find people to play online with those kind of time controls. So what I would say is, um, Play something like, you know what, I can leave this. Um, If you go to something like Lee Chess, I'm a huge fan of, right? You can play something like um, 30 plus zero. That's uh, 30 minutes each with no increment, so no time is added. Or even longer is 30-20, right? But honestly, for most people, I think something like 15 minutes, 10-second increment. So every time you move, you get 10 seconds back, just to make that clear what's happening there right, is more than slow enough. And playing longer not only counts more, right, it focuses me a great deal, okay? I'm in a weekly tournament right now that somebody was nice enough to put together 
um, that is game 45 with a five second increment. So that's, those games are quite long, especially for online. It's that's, and for anybody who's just deep in their feet in, right. It's, it's maybe forever, maybe too long. Um, but I take those games very seriously. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so that to me is the, is the best, um, gradient, right. Play, play a lot of quick games to get a feel and sort of learn where the pieces go, as we like to say, and get some, you know, you don't want to play game 45 and fall victim to one of those drop a piece out of the opening kind of mistakes, right? Because what's the point in playing on for most people? You just want to resign, right? You're done with it. And, you know, you signed up to play game 45 and now the thing's over. So I recommend really cutting your teeth with some blitz and 10 minute. And then when you feel like, you know, okay, this is good, but like I, I want more time to think, right? It's really starting to bother me. I'm using all my time and losing on time a lot. Well, I think you're ready to do something longer, right? And, and get something out of it. 